Within our cells, there's a coordinated and intricate interplay between the pentose phosphate pathway and the glycolytic pathway. And so what I'd like to focus on in this lecture is the factors that actually influence how this coordinated interplay between these two processes actually plays out. And so what we're going to do is we're going to discuss four different cases that can exist within a given cell of our body. So let's begin with case number one. So in case number one, we're basically assuming that our cells need NADPH molecules as much as they actually need ribose 5 phosphate molecules. Now, before we discuss this any further, let's actually remember what our cells use NADPH for and what our cells use the ribose 5 phosphate molecule for. Well, the NADPH molecule is a very important reducing agent that our cell uses for a variety of different types of biosynthetic processes and detoxification processes. For instance, our cells can use NADPH for processes such as fatty acid synthesis, cholesterol synthesis, neurotransmitter synthesis, and nucleotide synthesis. Now, what about ribose 5-phosphate? Well, ribose 5-phosphate is the molecule that is basically needed to build nucleotide based molecules. So molecules such as DNA molecules and RNA molecules depend on the presence of ribose 5-phosphate. So if our cell needs to build, for instance, DNA molecules, it needs to use, it needs to have a supply of ribose 5-phosphate. So once again, in this particular case, when our cells need the NADPH as much as they actually need the ribose 5-phosphate, this is what the cell will carry out. So it will not carry out the glycolytic pathway and it will not carry out the non-oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway. Instead, it will only carry out the oxidative phase of the pathway, the pentose phosphate pathway. Why? Well, because this is the phase that generates NADPH molecules as well as those ribose 5-phosphate molecules. So this is what the reaction looks like. We have an input of a single 1-glucose 6-phosphate molecule, or a single glucose 6-phosphate molecule, a single water molecule, and two NADP plus molecules. And what we form is the two NADPH molecules and one ribose 5-phosphate molecule. In addition, we also produce a carbon the oxide and two H plus ions. So basically this is what the cell will carry out and then it will use these molecules to help carry out other processes that we discussed just a moment ago. Now let's move on to case two. Now, in case number two, we're assuming that our cell actually needs the ribose 5-phosphate molecule much more than it needs the NADPH molecule. Now, what's an example of a cell that will experience this particular case? Well, a cell that is about to divide. A cell that is about to divide needs to actually replicate and build nucleic acids DNA molecules and so in such a case it actually needs the ribose sugar molecule much more than it needs the NADPH molecule. So what exactly will happen in such a case? Well in such a case the cell will not actually undergo oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway. What will happen is once again we begin with that glucose 6-phosphate molecule and now we undergo the glycolytic pathway and so what we form is fructose 6-phosphate molecules as well as glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules. Why? Well because now our cell can use the fructose 6-phosphate and the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and it can undergo the reverse steps of non-oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway because combining these two will allow the cell to actually build the much needed ribose 5-phosphate molecules which it can then use to build those DNA molecules nucleic acid. So under such conditions when the cell needs the ribose 5-phosphate much more than it needs the NADPH molecules the glucose 6-phosphate metabolite is converted via the, uh, via the glycolytic pathway into GAP glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate and then these molecules are, con are converted via the reverse non-oxidative steps 
of the pentose phosphate pathway into the ribose 5 phosphate. Now, the correct stoichiometric net equation for this particular reaction is given to us here. So we input five glucose 6-phosphate molecules and we use up a single ATP molecule and we generate six ribose 5-phosphate molecules, a single ADP molecule, and two H plus ions. So let's discuss why we have a ratio of five to six molecules and where the ATP actually comes from. So we have four glucose 6-phosphate molecules that we convert into four fructose 6-phosphate molecules. We take the fifth glucose 6-phosphate and we convert it into a fructose 6-phosphate, but we don't stop there. We take that fructose 6-phosphate, we use an ATP molecule to transform it into the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So this ATP that we use here is this same ATP that is used to actually transform the fifth fructose 6-phosphate into this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And then we basically transform that into, or we break down this into these two intermediates, dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now, this is readily transformed into the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And so the fifth glucose 6-phosphate that goes into this glycolytic pathway is used to form two of these glyceraldehyde 3 3-phosphate molecules. So four of these five glucose 6-phosphates are used to form four fructose 6-phosphate and the final glucose 6-phosphate is used to form two of these glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates and that process actually needs an ATP and so we form an AT or we use an ATP and we form an ADP in this pro on, on the product side here. Now, how do we form six ribose 5-phosphates from these five glucose 6-phosphates? Well, remember the steps of the non-oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway. In that particular phase, we saw that we use three ribose 5-phosphates to generate two fructose 6-phosphates and one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And so what that means is because we have four fructose 6-phosphates and two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates, if we combine these two, we're actually going to form six ribose 5-phosphate molecules because we need two fructose and one GAP to form three ribose 5-phosphates, but because we have double that amount, we form not three, but six ribose 5-phosphate molecules. So this is what a dividing cell would actually follow because it actually needs the ribose 5-phosphate molecules much more than those NADPH molecules. Now, let's move on to case three. So in case three, our cells need the NADPH much more than they actually need the ribose 5-phosphate molecule. So what type of cell would experience this type of scenario? Well, a cell that is continually undergoing fatty acid biosynthesis, for instance, and this would mean a fat cell. So fat cells basically follow this particular pathway. So we actually have three individual steps. So we have a glucose 6-phosphate is transformed into ribose 5-phosphate. So let's erase that for a moment. So we have a single glucose 6-phosphate is transformed into ribose 5-phosphate and we generate the two NADPH molecules. And this is essentially the oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway. Next, we undergo the non-oxidative phase and we break down the ribose 5-phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And actually, the correct stoichiometric coefficients for this, we have two and we have one glyceraldehyde for three of these molecules that are actually formed or that are actually used. So we need to actually use three ribose 5-phosphates to produce two fructose 6-phosphates and a single glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So so that's the second step. And in the third step, the fructose 6-phosphate molecules and the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate follow certain gluconeogenic steps. So we undergo gluconeogenesis 
and that allows us to reform that glucose 6-phosphate. So this is basically what a fat cell follows because a fat cell needs the NADPH molecules much more than it actually needs the ribose 5-phosphate. And now that the cell was able to actually recycle these two intermediate molecules, fructose 6-phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, back into the glucose 6-phosphate, the cell can use that glucose 6-phosphate via this step to produce even more NADPH molecules. So let's actually summarize these three steps. So in step one, we have 6G6P, where G6P is the glucose 6-phosphate molecules. So we have 12 NADP plus molecules and 6 water molecules. And that produces 6R5P, where R stands for the ribose, so R, um, ribose 5-phosphate, 12 NADPH molecules, 6 carbon dioxide molecules, and 12 H plus ions. This is basically this step. So we multiply all these coefficients by 6. This becomes 6, this becomes 6, this becomes 6, this becomes 12, 12, and 12, and 6. Now, in the second step is, we're essentially going this way. So we have 6 ribose 5-phosphates that we form, and that helps us generate 4 fructose 6-phosphates and 2 glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates. And then we take these two intermediates and we react them via the gluconeogenesis. And so we basically have these same two reactants here, a water molecule, and that helps us generate five glucose 6-phosphates and a single orthophosphate. And so if we sum up all these reactions, this is the net reaction that we're going to have. And so, notice we have a single glucose 6-phosphate and none of the glucose 6-phosphates actually appear on the product side. And so, ultimately, what this basically tells us is, in cells such as fat cells, which need the NADPH much more than they actually need the ribose sugar molecule, these cells are able to actually metabolize and break down the G6P, the glucose 6-phosphate, and form the 12 NADPH molecules. And we also generate the carbon dioxide, the uh, orthophosphate, as well as the 12 H plus ions. And so in these particular cells, they don't actually need the ribose, they only need the NADPH molecules. And so this is what they actually follow. So we have this interplay, this coordinated interplay between the pentose phosphate pathway and the glycolytic pathway, which allows the cell to actually maximize the production of these much needed NADPH molecules. And finally, let's move on to case four, the final case. So in case four, our cells basically need not only the NADPH molecules, but also ATP molecules, energy molecules. So in this particular case, this is what the cell actually follows. So notice in this case, we took these intermediates and we transformed them back into the glucose 6-phosphate. But in this case, these same intermediates will not follow gluconeogenesis. Instead, they will follow the glycolytic pathway to help us generate the ATP. So let's see exactly what we mean. So once again, we begin with the glucose 6-phosphate metabolite. We have oxidative phosphorylation take place and we form the two NADP molecules and the ribose 6-phosphate. So these molecules basically satisfy this requirement. But what about the ATP? Well, the ribose 6-phosphate can undergo the non-oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway to generate the GAP, the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates, and the fructose 6-phosphates. And these intermediates can enter the glycolytic pathway and through the glycolytic pathway, they can be used to actually form the pyruvate molecules and the ATP molecules. So for the case of fructose 6-phosphate, it goes on to form the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, then it goes on to break down to these two intermediates, and that then goes on to form the pyruvate. For the case of GAP, the GAP goes into these steps, and then that forms the pyruvate molecule. Now, the 
ATP formed here satisfy this requirement. What about the pyruvate? Well, the pyruvate can then enter oxidative phosphorylation. It can undergo oxidative phosphorylation, meaning the pyruvate can go into the mitochondrion of the cell. It can basically undergo the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain to basically form even more ATP molecules. So these are the four different cases that can exist inside our cells, which basically describe the coordinated interplay between the glycolytic pathway and the pentose phosphate pathway.